good afternoon, and that two-footed free kick technique from 1970 was subsequently banned. But this afternoon, you'll see an amended 1982 legal version. It happens in our second game between Manchester City and Swansea, which follows European Cup winners Aston Villa against FA Cup winners Tottenham Hotspur. It's goal of the month time, too. Some intriguing news around today. A reason why Southampton's Alan Ball missed a penalty on his farewell appearance in the First Division. A come and get me plea from former England captain Mick Mills to first and second division managers and Jock Steen's intention to leave the Scotland team manager's job before the next World Cup finals. Well, let's get into the action now from Villa Park for the game between Aston Villa and Spurs. And both clubs have trophy cabinets sufficiently full to make even the Joneses envious, but they're only too aware that it's what happens today and tomorrow that'll keep their turnstiles clicking. Your commentator, John Motson. Peter With, needing one goal for his 100 in league football, returns after suspension, determined to curb his impatience with referees, which has got him booked so often, and hoping to reproduce against Spurs, the form he showed last season when he scored three times in four meetings between the two clubs. Villa lost both matches while With has been out, including the Milk Cup tie at Notts County. An injury to their young right-back Mark Jones in that match means Gary Williams switches to number two and Alan Evans has recovered from an ankle injury to slot back in at number four. Spurs also welcome back an international defender, Chris Houghton at number three in place of Gary O'Reilly. He's the first of their six injured stars to return, but Glenn Hoddle and Graham Roberts play in the reserves today. Steve Archibald and Steve Perryman hope to play in a friendly on Monday but Tony Galvin is still some way off full fitness. Indeed, Garth Crooks is Spurs only ever present this season. He's top scorer with 11 goals, and on his last appearance at Villa Park here in the FA Cup semi-final against Leicester, he took a pass from Ozzy Ardiles and put Spurs on their way to Wembley. Keith Birkinshaw's team have only lost one of their last 11 games, a fine testament to his management when you think how many players he's been missing. Referee this afternoon, Clive Thomas of Porthcawl. Mark Falco on the far side as Spurs kick off. He scored twice against Villa last season in the Charity Shield and also got the goal which knocked them out of the FA Cup at White Hart Lane. But on the ball now, it's Paul Miller for Tottenham who are playing from the right in the white shirts. Gary Williams away from Gary Mabbott. who tackles him. Gary Mabbott playing at Villa Park for the first time in his career. It was saying to me just before the kickoff how much he's looking forward to the atmosphere. Hewton. Falco, Hewton again. In the long English season, players who have a little break, even though it's enforced with injury, sometimes come back refreshed and Chris Hewton the first of the Spurs wounded to return, pushing forward effectively in the attack there. And talking of injuries, Aston Villa's Ken McNaught just feeling the right ankle, rather. This is Shaw. Mabbott's moved forward into the penalty area. Villa. Goes past Gibson. Hazard. And Falco. Ball took a deflection off Ken McNaught's corner from Mark Falco's shot. Short to Villa. And now Hazard. Good try! What a great save by Jimmy River. That was in all the way from this angle. And I think Hazard believes it too. Wonderful response from the Aston Villa goalkeeper. He was off to his left to make a fingertip save.
Brooks corner. Falco with the flick. Bremner with the header out. Terrific save from the experienced Jimmy Rimmer. on the kick by Jimmy Rimmer giving with the chance to compete with Lacey and beat him sure and with and Cowan's with oh left foot of Ray Clements as long as you keep them out here's Morley Shaw Bremner Tottenham besieged rather there Shaw Mortimer Morley out left Mortimer hanging on too long. Aston Villa losing their momentum then. Having just appeared to discover it in the previous attack. Villa. Well, Peter with beat Lacey in the air. Was in the right position to get the return from Shaw. Hit a firm shot, and Ray Clements, reacting instinctively, kept it out with his left foot. Mabbott's header. Hazard. And here's again. Brooks. Hazard's got Brooks square, but it's played in for Falco to flick one down. Mabbott! Good save by Rimmer. And even Mabbott forced to applaud, as indeed the whole end are doing in unison. Cowans to whiff. Cowans again. Morley. Whiff is coming in. And Clements wasn't quite sure where he was, hence he had to make the save. Corner to Villa, although the ball might well have carried out anyway, unbeknown to Clements. And McNaught up there with Clements, away by Falco, out to Morley. And half-time gives us a chance to pay a well-deserved compliment to Jimmy Rimmer. Two marvellous saves. One from Hazard going to his left, one from Mabbott going to his right. He's missed only one league match in five years at Villa. But how strange that he has the distinction of holding two European Cup winners' medals while playing in a final for just eight minutes. He came off in Villa's match against Bayern Munich, you'll recall, last season, injured. And back in 1968, he was Manchester United substitute goalkeeper when they beat Benfica in the European Cup final. Quite a career and quite a goalkeeper half-time there's a chance to catch up on scores from other grounds doubtless listening to BBC Radio Sport on 2 Spurs began the match as joint top scorers in the first division with 25 goals although it might be worth making the point that 21 of them had been scored at White Hart Lane Gary Brook taking on Gibson And Hazard, back to Price, Crooks, and Price coming in, nice effort that, oh, what a flying header away by Ken McNaught. Mark Falco was the player who would have capitalised had McNaught not intervened from Price's cross, but that was a spectacular and vital piece of defending by the Aston Villa centre-half. Away by Cowens this time. Hazard. Crooks making the run, but McNaught is also there. Here's Falco.
Mortimer. With Mortimer. With Hewton. Perseverance paid off there for him. Clive Thomas a very good decision Alan Evans definitely knocked Garth Crooks as he came through to get the ball there one of those that would often have gone unpunished by a lesser referee and Clive Thomas saw it and gave it and Ricky Villiard puts the free kick over the bar little simmering argument has gone on most of the afternoon between two players who Clive Thomas has had in his eye line. He's now angry with Jimmy Rimmer, presumably for dissent. Ken McNaught has come across. Referee Thomas, in my view, absolutely right about the foul by Evans on Crooks. Jimmy Rimmer obviously saying something to the referee, and he was booked. But Crooks and Evans have been having quite a tussle and it hasn't escaped the referee's notice. With. And now a free kick the other way, which gets a raucous cheer from the Villa Park faithful. Here's Gordon Cowens. Was with foul, penalty. <laughs> Gary Mabbott's arm was up when he challenged Peter With on the cross. And Villar's going to be booked. Ricky Villar, the Tottenham captain, said something to Clive Thomas and is booked. Gordon Cowens, who missed one last week at Norwich when he hit the post, tries to make up for that, and does. Despite a fine effort by Ray Clements, who went the right way, but Gordon Cowens has put Aston Villa into the lead. After 57 minutes... So, Villa take the lead after two interesting refereeing points in that Clive Thomas was quick to spot the Alan Evans foul at the other end and then equally quick to see Gary Mabbott infringing in the opposite penalty area and I for one wouldn't argue with either decision here's Cowens and here's Mortimer and off John Lacey for a corner So, Evans and McNaught both forward. Well taken. Wanted to uh, temper spray back in the penalty area when Peter Whiff challenged Ray Clements there. Falco. Inside to Crooks, Falco, deflection and another fine save. Well, Falco always seems to strike against Aston Villa, but Jimmy Rimmer was aware of that and even of the deflection. Hazard again, just waiting for movement. Crooks is in the centre, away by Evans, Brook. Mabbott, good effort, hit the bar. Rimmer could have got a touch even. Certainly came back off the crossbar from Gary Mabbott. It's not over yet, Brook. And Crooks may have been offside. But Gary Mabbott 
who hit the post for England against West Germany with that sort of instinctive shot was unlucky again today. Oh, good running by Cowens. Number two. And the man of the match, Gordon Cowens, gets his second. 12 minutes from the end. The Villa fans on the Holt end applaud, and what a move it was. Dennis Mortimer fed the perfect ball through, and Gordon Cowens ran on to beat Clements with so much confidence. And Cowens who was 24 last Wednesday, has surely reminded Bobby Robson that he's still around. Two nil to the Villa. Ricky Villar for Spurs. Brook. Well, there was confidence about that piece of finishing. Peter with on the chase. And Shaw. Gary Shaw and Tony Morley. 3-0. Spurs are pulled apart now. Two in a minute for Aston Villa. Peter with made the running down the left. Gary Shaw's shot just flew across the face of the goal. And Tony Morley buried the chance. So Villa, who've had some indifferent league results this season, are now three up and looking very healthy indeed. Morley got the third. So two goals in a minute would appear to have put the match beyond Tottenham's reach. But here's Crooks. And here's Falco. Gibson's was the challenge. Lacey coming near post, his Falco. Here's Hazard. Crooks through the centre, and he beat McNaught, and he couldn't beat Rimmer. And Evans squares up to Crooks, not for the first time. But Crooks there had the ball played through by Mick Hazard beyond the centre-half, and still Jimmy Rimmer remained unperturbed. So a good afternoon for Tony Barton's team. Villa manager peering out of the dugout there. to show Shaw's cross will find Morley Morley curls one and it was Gary Mabbott that put it behind the goal that was a lovely curling effort from Tony Morley and if it wasn't going to go in well there was a Villa player Gary Williams behind Mabbott with the corner he fell as he took it Evans back again to Cowns with offside very sure consoled by Ray Clements because the flag was up as with not the ball back in where Shaw and McNaught were standing no goal
so what was a tentative performance earlier by Aston Villa has become quite a convincing one it would seem certainly the Tottenham attackers look toothless in the second half but one has to remember again how many players they're still without Mortimer surging run Shaw's on the far side Shaw brilliant goal a goal which says so much about Aston Villa and Dennis Mortimer in particular he harried McHazard in midfield he won the ball he got away down the left Gary Shaw pulled away to the far side but when Mortimer's cross came in Shaw was the player that headed it in firmly into the corner and with six minutes to go Aston Villa have gone 4-0 up Brooks to Brook, maybe a chance of a consolation for Spurs. Gary Brook, oh, another good save. Well, Brook saw the gap to Rivers' left, or to his right from uh, Brook's position, and seemed to have aimed it in the right corner of the goal, and Rivers saved even that. Tony Barton's worried about the injury, his lacy. Brooks is up with Rimmer. It's gone over the bar, but uh, the Villa bench aware that all this has happened while Alan Evans is on his back in the Tottenham penalty area nursing a leg injury and they will make possibly a very late substitution with Eamon DC preparing if needed Tony Barton and Roy McLaren just trying to indicate that Alan Evans should make his way off the field but knowing the kind of fella he is he'll want to stay on Lacey for Tottenham sets one up for Hazard perhaps <laughs> shot hit McNaught Price Falco down to Villa and Mabbott Hazard Falco is coming in on the cross and was blocked by Evans who is playing on in pain Villa with the corner Peter with up to prevent Paul Miller reaching it and Spurs taken apart in the second half by a ruthless emphatic performance from the European Cup holders Keith Birkenshaw I'm sure admitting although the first goal was a penalty which Spurs contested that Tony Barton's team came good with Tony Morley one of the scorers he made it 3-0 in fact the man of the match possibly the scorer of the first two goals the Villa number 10 Gordon Cowens and with him there scorer of number four Gary Shaw so Villa go into their European tie I would think full of confidence while Tottenham go to Munich hoping to get one or two of their injured players back well the tide certainly turned in that game with not a little help from Jimmy Rimmer and you'll be able to admire his special ability later but for our skill spot we first take a look at England's bright new star Gary Mabbott initiating a break which tests him to the full first of all it shows his awareness that once the ball comes back to him here he's not content just to get it under control he lays that off seemingly to no one but he'd spotted Mark Falco who flicks it back to him first time the next thing we can see is his two-footedness and his ingenuity as he finds that way of getting past Evans. But now a skill from the past, one that Tom Finney used to do so well, shutting off a chasing opponent. He gets across him, he's in playing distance, it's not a foul, but in the end the three players outnumber him. He checks, sees Brook to his right, plays the ball to him, and it's that break that we now see finish in normal speed. The all-round ability of... But it was Villa's day and a chance to pay tribute to an unusual skill from what we might term an old-fashioned centre forward, Peter Wyth. But just look at this as the volley comes up there from Gibson, a little back heel pass off the sole of the foot there, right in Mortimer's pass, 
It beat the whole of the defence, but uh, Shaw, who's on the ball now, unfortunately was offside. But the man of the match, really, I thought was Gordon Cowan. A fragile player in many respects, but not in stamina. He looks fragile, but he's got a, a lot of strength, and he gets around the field. Very, very nimbly indeed. Clever dribbling skill there, and very deft passing touch. But it just gives us one more chance to look at Peter Witt and assess that with that deft header, that there's brains in his head as well as skill in his feet. Well, before we leave that game, just a word about the penalty. And it arose from Gary Mabbott's awareness and determination to get back and out jump Peter Wythe, who was lurking on the far post. Colin Gibson crosses it, but unfortunately, in his anxiety to get there, Mabbott mistimed the ball and fell all over Peter Wythe. And Clive Thomas, perfectly placed, had a clear view, and that was that. Well, now the match which contains the novel free kick. It's between Manchester City and Swansea City, and your commentator is Alan Parry. An unfamiliar vantage point for Swansea manager John Toshak, but it's one he'll have to get used to. Banished from his normal place on the touchline for speaking out of turn to referees, Toshak must watch his team from the stands for the next four months, and perhaps earplugs will be provided for anyone with a seat nearby. Well, Swansea have had crippling injury problems this season, and the latest victim is captain Ray Kennedy. His absence causes another reshuffle, and a victim of the changes is one of Swansea's best-known players, Alan Curtis, whose failure to score a league goal this season sees him relegated to substitute. His place at number seven goes to Ian Walsh, who's starting a match for the first time this season, though he did score a hat-trick as substitute in the Cup Winners' Cup tie against Sleema of Malta. The home side, Manchester City, meanwhile, field an unchanged team for the third successive match. It again means there's no place for Nicky Reid, named as substitute, with manager John Bond favouring his son Kevin as the centre-back partner for Tommy Cake. Skipper Paul Power celebrates his 29th birthday today. So it's Swansea City in the white shirts and black shorts who kick off, attacking from left to right at the scene of the ground which brought their heaviest ever First Division defeat. They lost 4-0 here last November, that following a long trip to the Soviet Union for a European tie. Some excuse, I'm sure. But they'll certainly be looking for a better performance today. Manchester City, who come fresh from a very good performance against Manchester United in the local derby a week ago, when they led the first division leaders 2-0 at one stage, though drew two all in the end. Paul Power conceding the throw. And back by Walsh to Stanley. And three in the box here for Swansea. Had Ziabdic on the far side. Leighton James wanted it played quickly short. And in the end, Had Ziabdic wins the corner. Although the referee has uh, disagreed with my interpretation and that of the Swansea players, he's given a goal kick. Mahoney. Cross knocks it down for Baker. Stewart. Dwelt a little bit too long on the ball then, Dennis Stewart. And Swansea break with Latchford and Leighton James. Stewart again. Here's Caton. Cross and Hartford. Here's Power. Hartford finding it difficult to find the space. And the clearance was by Jeremy Charles. Caton Stewart has taken up a good position in the box, and he spots him too, but the header by Charles denied Stewart, but does give Manchester City a corner. Kevin Bond has come forward, taken up a position on the near post. And McDonald, who sneaks a lot of goals, also forward. And that was very close. Davis beaten by the cross, and it was Hedzi Abdic back to clear. Oh, and Latchford could be clear at the other end. Has he got the pace? 
Mahoney with him. Bond back, and it comes to Walsh, and Corrigan makes a superb save. Well, two Swansea players broke clear then, Latchford and Walsh. The final shot came in from Walsh, and how splendidly Corrigan dealt with it. Cross and Stevenson climbing, and it's Cross who wins. Hartford. Here's Baker. McDonald on the left. Baker, this is Ranson. Five City players forward here. Came off Reeves, and again, what a good effort by Kevin Reeves. Deserved applause for an imaginative piece of thinking by Kevin Reeves, hitting that ball on the volley only just over. City, Swansea. This is Reeves. Power takes over. And a good cross. Oh, fine effort. How well City built up down the left then. And what a good cross by Paul Power. David Cross came flying in at the near post. And the header flew just wide. But a good build-up by Manchester City. On by Reeves, away by Stevenson. Here's Latchford. Swansea really not getting things together in midfield at all. And how well Kevin Bond extricated himself from that. And still he goes forward and is caught from behind by the tackle by Hadziabdic. Floated into Reeves. Jeremy Charles behind him. And was he holding him? The referee has given an indirect free kick for obstruction by Jeremy Charles. Interesting decision. 15 minutes gone, and Manchester City have an unusual free kick, to say the least. Not very often you see uh, an indirect free kick at this angle in the box. What will they try? Stewart! be a contender for one of the most unusual goals of the season if not one of the goals of the season magnificent effort Swansea had four players guarding that near post the ball was flicked up and Stewart smashed it into the roof of the net for a splendid goal Manchester City won Swansea City nil and a goal that will be talked about for some time to come I'm sure Memories revived of a famous Coventry City goal involving Willie Carr and Ernie Hunt a few years ago. A debate about the legality of that one, I remember, but referee Ken Redfern had no doubts that Church's goal should stand. This is Caton. And how much more accomplished the Manchester City defenders look with the ball than Swansea. Jeremy Charles has given it straight to Stewart. And here's Baker. Cross. Unlucky David Cross. It was a difficult angle. Baker going down to the byline and pulling the ball back left footed. Cross rising as well as he always does, but this time the header went wide. ball for Latchford at Ziabdic great run here by Leighton James into space and turned back for Walsh well he was a matter of inches away from a goal then good ball played into the box Leighton James had made a fine run 
pull this cross back almost perfectly, but agonizingly inches away from Walsh. Ransom. Stewart. Caton. Power unmarked on the left. Caton again. Good cross. Oh! Oh, that was slow motion. Everybody throws. Stewart was the only one to react. And a corner is the outcome. Well, Caton with a great cross from the left. Everybody froze for a moment. Stewart reacted and the shot was deflected for a corner. Reeves had out. And that's half time and a very entertaining half it's been. Dennis Stewart with a spectacular and very unusual goal, giving Manchester City a well-deserved half-time lead. Crowd have enjoyed City's performance. It's flowed and bubbled along at times, and Swansea have really had no answer to it. Half time score Manchester City 1, Swansea City 0. So Manchester City look to build on their one goal lead, having proved, I think, in the first half that good football isn't just about what you do when you've got the ball, it's also about how difficult you make it for the opposition when they're in possession. City have made it very difficult indeed for Swansea. Free kick given to the visitors, who are still looking for their first away win in the league this season. They've taken only two points away from uh, the Vetchfield so far. Jeremy Charles free kick. Walsh winning it. Stewart. if Swansea will alter their tactics in any way. Mikovic making a gift to McDonald. There's Reeves. McDonald a good ball. Power. Well, that was fine. Uh, enthusiasm on the part of Gary Stanley, who kept chasing what might have seemed a lost cause. Latchford's header. Donald, Reeves, spins away from defenders so well, here's Power, Stewart, well that was clever, Power, he goes down, Manchester City turn, an appeal to the referee who turns his back on those appeals, well, something to talk about as Power getting on to the end of that delightful little chip through pass by Stewart, went down in the box, and with a challenge from a Swansea defender, but no foul, says the referee. Ransom. Robbie James got up well, here's Mahoney. But a good ball, Reeves. Corner off Rykovic. Kevin Bond, number four, coming forward to the near post. McDonald getting up, good fist by Davis, but here's Baker, and Davis did well. Must have been difficult that for Davis, having fisted the ball away originally it came driving back at him through a crowd of players from Baker's shot and he got down and pushed it clear again McDonald Baker McDonald again power on the left oh, he's given the ball away twice in this attack McDonald Again, 
good effort. Well, that was an amazing incident. Walsh hitting the ball, Joe Corrigan parrying the shot away. It came to Leighton James, and his effort only just wide. Corrigan, who uh, normally holds on to them, even though it was fiercely struck. Cross. Oh, that was ambitious. Cross spotting Davis slightly out of position, perhaps. Trying a shot from, I suppose, it must have been something like 30 to 35 yards. Baker, good header. Halfford. Power. Hartford, superbly struck goal by Asa Hartford. The 65th minute of the game and Manchester City take a 2-0 lead. What a fine move it was down the left-hand side. Power involved as ever. When the ball came in to Hartford, he struck it sweetly along the ground into the corner of the net. Manchester City 2, Swansea City 0. Asa Hartford, the scorer. So, a fitting and belated celebration of his 32nd birthday six days ago, Asa Hartford. Lost his place, of course, in the uh, Scotland squad these days. And maybe his international career is over, but still doing a fine job for Manchester City. other's way and McDonald it seemed to me brought down Walsh and the referee saw it that way too now then it may be at the very least a booking would it be termed a professional foul I wonder was Walsh on his way to goal well the referee had a good view of the incident and I think certainly McDonald will be booked Walsh had got away when uh, McDonald collided with his own player and he clearly brought Walsh down and a booking result Stanley takes it and one, two, three take your pick Swansea players are all offside well in fact they're going to get a second bite which is rather mystifying for some reason the referee wasn't happy with the execution of the original free kick and has told Swansea to take it again at least they know what to look out for now. Stanley takes it again. Latchford! What a good goal by Bob Latchford! So, second time proved to be second time lucky for Swansea. The crowd furious because they don't understand why the free kick was allowed to be taken again. But when it was, it was floated in by Stanley and Latchford firmly planted the header into the corner of the net. Stewart seems to have gone into the referee's notebook for protesting. And I must say, it wasn't clear why referee Redfern made Swansea take that free kick again. But take it again, they did. And the end result for them was a happy one. Manchester City 2, Swansea City 1, and a substitution made. Alan Curtis comes on to replace Leighton James. And all of a sudden, things look a lot happier for Swansea. Diabdic, the ball, Latchford, Walsh, Stanley, Latchford, well it was an earlier repeat performance, great run down the right by Gary Stanley and the cross was neat too to the near post, Latchford rising well but this time heading over. 
Reeves has got clear. Comes to Baker. Well, the ball was pulled back to him by Reeves. Baker had a goal yawning at his mercy, but had to hit the ball wide. his throw, the referee has looked at his watch Charles Walsh with the flick and there's the final whistle as Curtis receives the ball, too late an enterprising and entertaining match full of lively and good football two free kicks that will be talked about one scored by Dennis Stewart, and another twice taken, which allowed this man, Bob Latchford, to score that consolation goal for Swansea. And Asa Hartford proving to be the match winner with that finely struck shot that keeps Manchester City with th three points in the bag. And Swansea City still looking for their first away win of the season. Full-time score, Manchester City 2, Swansea City 1. An enjoyable game to view, I thought. Plenty of ideas coming from both teams. But there's no doubt about the selection of the skill spot. It picks itself and arose after Manchester City were perhaps a fraction lucky to be awarded an indirect free kick. But that didn't worry the principal actors. So many players in there, it's going to be difficult for City to carve something. What will they try? Stewart! Well, chaps, I can't believe you spend all week practicing indirect free kicks in the opposition penalty area, but it certainly looked that way, Dennis. Yeah, well, I, uh, I went originally went to line up in front of their wall, and Asa just called me over and he said, uh, bit tight, do you fancy having a try with a volley if I can pick it up for you? I said, yeah, because we tried it once before, just before I went to, uh, to the States and I hit the bar on that, on that occasion, but today it worked pretty well. So it was improvised on the spot then, Asa? Well, yeah, we had to uh, try and get Tommy Keane out of the way, because Tommy wanted me to touch the ball and... Uh, I think he fancy driving a hole through somebody with a bomb. <coughs> but there didn't seem enough room. Uh, it looked as if it was going to be charged in. And the only way we were going to score, I think, was to get over the wall. And Dennis, of course, might hit it perfectly. Of course, now that everybody knows, you'll have to think of something else. Uh, well, we could move that back to Tommy Keaton punching the horns. <laughs> <laughs> well, yesterday marked the end of an era in English football when Alan Ball played his last game in the first division. Happily, Ball, he finished on a winning side, Southampton beating one of his former clubs, Everton, at 3-2, but only after suffering the heartache of missing a penalty. What no one realised, outside his teammates and manager Laurie McMenemy, is that Alan played his last match after breaking the little toe of his right foot only minutes before kickoff. It was a self-inflicted injury which took place as Alan was walking from the dressing room into the bathroom area. He told me I was absent-mindedly reading a paper and simply stubbed my toe on a door. The club doctor gave me an injection to numb the pain and apart from the last 10 minutes it got me through. Fairly typical of the little man that he made no fuss about it and refused to blame his penalty miss on it either. The future of former England captain Mick Mills continues to create great speculation, but today the Ipswich veteran totally dismissed stories about a possible move to Reading. What Mick did say should alert most second division managers. He told us, I'm sitting at home waiting for a club who wants me to play for them for two years. It seems people have been put off by suggestions of my going as a coach or manager. All I want to do is play for another two years and not necessarily in the first division. So the message from Mick is clear and today Chelsea manager John Neal confirmed that his club was still very much in the hunt and that despite just buying Joey Jones from Wrexham. Mick is not just a fullback, said Neal, he's a good midfield man and all-purpose player. Perhaps the real favourites to sign Mills though are first division Sunderland. The most worried footballer today is Ashley Grimes. Manchester United's Republic of Ireland International was sent off at West Ham yesterday for violent conduct, appearing to make contact with Oxford referee Dennis Hedges when protesting angrily about a decision. I must say it seemed to me that Ashley didn't strike the referee but was trying to stop him. And United manager Ron Atkinson has said it wasn't premeditated, Ashley was very remorseful. But Ron has also made it clear that Grimes will face club disciplinary action and accepts that he could be charged by the FA with bringing the game into disrepute, for which, if found guilty, he could face a further two or three match ban. European football this week, and no great problems for England's European Cup representatives, Aston Villa and Liverpool. 
And in the Cup Winners' Cup, Spurs hope to include Glenn Hoddle, Graham Roberts, Steve Archibald and Steve Perriman in their squad which travels to Bayern Munich on Tuesday for a tricky second leg. 1-1 the score at present. Spurs assistant manager Peter Shreves told me that all four players who've been injured will play in a friendly against Southend in the morning and barring further trouble he believes Hoddle and Archibald have the best chance of playing in Germany. Swansea 1-0 down against Paris Saint-Germain go to France hopeful that skipper Ray Kennedy's thigh injury will have healed. Transfer news and Norwich manager Ken Brown told us he's hopeful of signing Manchester City's Norwegian international defender Oggy Harida tomorrow or Tuesday on a month's loan with a view to a permanent move. England international Peter Barnes, currently on a year's contract with Spanish club Real Betis from Leeds, could return to Manchester City on a loan basis, but only if there was no question of big money being involved. Kevin Beattie, the former Ipswich and England defender, now on a weekly contract with Colchester, is expected to join Middlesbrough and Malcolm Allison before next Saturday's game at Ayrson Park against Barnsley. And Leeds international Brian Flynn will return to his former club Burnley this week if personal terms can be agreed. The actual transfer fee, £60,000. Leeds United are again facing the threat of ground closure following trouble at Elland Road yesterday during the game against Newcastle. And FA Secretary Ted Croker said this afternoon, it's at least the fourth recurrence of trouble involving Leeds this season. Something has got to be done and something will be done. This afternoon, Leeds general manager Keith Archer said, these thugs have put the whole jeopardy of the club in, uh, the whole future of the club in jeopardy. Our finances are in such a delicate state that a heavy fine from the FA could finish us. North of the border, meanwhile, Jock Steen has made it clear that he intends to leave the job of Scottish team manager before the next World Cup final. This was his reply when asked by Archie McPherson whether he would really like to be in charge of the Scottish team in four years' time. I wouldn't like to take them through to the next World Cup. I would like to see them at the end of the European Championship being a good side and handing them over to someone to take over through the World Cup. And if he thinks I could be there to help him, good and well. But if not, I'd gladly step aside and let him go on. Well done to United's Jim McLean. One of Steen's assistants in Spain during the summer could be a leading candidate for the job. Yesterday, though, the only concern for Jim was to guide his United team to victory in the local Dundee derby. Well, beautifully touched on now. Riley. Hammers it in, and Gods tries to put it in, and has David Gods gets a rebound, and five minutes to go. At long last, they've gone into the league. Well, now it's time for our October Goal of the Month competition, in which there are eight very fine goals from which to choose, which reflect only too well the improving standard of league football shown on Match of the Day this season. And I'll remind you how to enter in a moment, but first a look at the goals, starting with goal A, scored by Kevin Keegan for Newcastle United against Rotherham United. McDermott, he's got Keegan in the box, this is Keegan, oh is this it? What a magnificent goal! So Callaghan, Sammy Lee chasing him back, and he's beaten it. And they've got three in the centre of Ipswich. And Dubre is there! Shot one by David Proven. Right, some good looking one, and it was McCannum coming in. And Steele trying the long shot off for the second wicket in a row. Tiny alongside Haradi. Oh, marvellous goal! McMahon! <laughs> Set through to Litvarski and now Rummeniger. That's easily done by him. Davis. Houghton was coming through. Wilson turned it on. Here's Gordon Davis. Well, what a good finish. It's 
Charlton on the ball. Good effort. What a brilliant goal. So many players in there, it's going to be difficult for City to carve something. What will they try? Stewart. Pretty good, weren't they? Well, here's a check on those goals. Goal A, Kevin Keegan. B, Mitch Davray. Goal C, Paul McStay. D, Steve McMahon. E, Karl Heinz Rummeniger. F, Gordon Davis. G, Ray Houghton. H, Dennis Stewart. And here's how to enter. You put your name and address on the left hand side of a postcard, please, and your goal selections in one, two, three order on the right hand side. Address the postcard to Goal of the Month. BBC Television, London, W12 8QT. That's Goal of the Month, BBC Television, London, W12 8QT. And the prize for the first postcard drawn out of the sack that coincides with the choice of our panel is £100 worth of premium bonds. Well, so exceptional are those goals that our panel of Bobby Robson, Bobby Charlton, Laurie McMenemy, Bob and myself will have quite a job sorting them out, and I think you will too. Well, we're never surprised at uh, how sensitive some viewers can be about their own club, often seeing insults when they were never intended. Well, a week or two ago, I referred to a non-league skill. Without malice, I assure you, after all, full-time players should become more skillful. But I am aware that there are exceptions to that general trend up and down the country. And, would you believe it, when I was joking with Elton John last week about his special playing ability, it's got to be a joke, that, a chairman or two took my jocular remarks about chairman's knowledge of the game to heart. All that I know is the more football I see, and folks for that matter, the less certain I am about anything. But I am certain that the result of the Villa v Spurs match might well have been different had it not been for some inspired and timely goalkeeping from Jimmy Rimmer. Good afternoon. Hazard's got Brooks square, but it's played in for Falco to flick one down. Mavertz! Good save by Rimmer. Falco, inside to Crooks. Falco, deflection and another fine save. Crooks through the centre, and he beat McNaught, and he couldn't beat Rimmer. And now Hazard. Good try! What a great save by Jimmy Rimmer. That was in all the way from this angle.